Welcome to the season three premiere episode of Jews on Film. My name is Harry Adensasser. I am one of the Jews on Film. And joining me, as always, is my co-host, Daniel Zana. Hey, Harry. Thanks for the intro. My name is Daniel Zana. I'm a documentary filmmaker and video editor and also a Jew. Uh, on our season three premiere, we have a special guest. Uh, our guest today is an American music industry entrepreneur, author, and musician. He's the president of the Beggars Group US, co-founder of Sonic Boom Records, drummer for The Lemons, The Long Winters, and Alien Crime Syndicate, and Brooklyn Magazine named him number seven in a list of the 100 most influential people in Brooklyn culture. His debut memoir, My Life in the Sunshine, is available now. Our guest uh, is Nabil Ayers. Nabil, welcome to Jews on Film. Thank you. What a great intro. It's nice to be here. Can I ask right off the top, how did you get to be number seven? <laughs> you know, I had, I, it started at 13. I had to take out like six other people to, to make it happen. No, I, I really don't know. They did. They did a list of 100. And I mean, you know how all lists are. I mean, they, they probably sit around a, some kind of conference room or a Zoom screen and, and hash it out. And <laughs> I really don't know. But I was I was honored. Yeah, that's a huge honor. Uh, I uh, used to live in Brooklyn, but I would definitely not consider myself at all influential to Brooklyn culture. Um, so it's a it's a real honor to speak with you today, uh, not only to talk about your book and to discuss, you know, your life in Seattle and everything, but to also discuss a film today that you picked for our podcast, yeah. Jews on Film, After Hours, directed by Martin Scorsese. So before we get into that, I wanted to, you know, take a trip in the Wayback Machine and sort of figure out what was your relationship or awareness of like Jewish film growing up? I mean, my mother is Jewish. My grandmother, her mother is Jewish. So by Jewish law, I am Jewish. I'm not a practicing Jew and that I don't go to temple, but I, I would consider myself a bit of a cultural Jew. My wife is Jewish. We celebrate holidays, love Jewish food, a cultural Jew. But I grew up um, with my mother and knowing my grandparents really well. And also knowing my great grandparents really well, who lived in Flatbush and are also Jewish. So that Jewish side of my family, that was my family. I don't know my father's side at all. I still don't. So we would go out to my great grandfather's place in Flatbush and, you know, eat gefilte fish. I mean, all the sort of like, it all sounds like a movie, but like the stereotypical things. I mean, those were my childhood experiences. I was around lots of Jewish food and so much Jewish film. I mean, really to me, Woody Allen, I mean, hard to talk about these days, but still as a kid, those movies were pretty incredible. And I remember seeing sleeper and bananas and like the really kind of wacky, funny seventies movies and just like rolling on the floor, laughing and getting the jokes and getting the cultural cues and then knowing that, you know, I had some part in this culture and then really feeling great about it. So that, that was Jewish film for me as a kid. That makes sense. Yeah. First of all, you know, love, love where you went with that sort of that cultural experience, seeing that reflected on film. You know, Daniel and I have discussed this in a number of episodes and we, we feel certainly the same way, that kind of excitement of seeing, you know, having the gefilte fish and then going to the next movie where someone's eating it. And <laughs> right. I know what that tastes like. You know? <laughs> totally. I'm surprised they're enjoying that so much because I've had that before, which by the way, I actually do for the record, love gefilte fish. Okay. So just my, just my wife makes great, she there. makes great gefilte fish, which I'd okay. actually, I don't think I'd ever had homemade gefilte fish until oh, nice. well into adulthood. Yeah. I don't wow. think I've ever had it. Sounds delicious. <laughs> you come like over. homemade, homemade, or like from the roll where you chop it up and then you. N no, homemade, homemade, right? Oh. Like all, like I don't even know what it is. It's like That's one of those mystery foods. It's like <laughs> meatloaf. Yeah, it's exactly. a lot like meatloaf, actually, but like right. it sounds like yeah, the, the ingredients that make the thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd be like real impressed if it was like a carp in the bathtub kind of situation, <laughs> or she's like clubbing it, and you know, but right. you know, still, still points for sure. Points awarded. You know, it, it's interesting hearing you say sort of the films that are reflected that sort of cultural Jewishness. I guess that brings us to our next question. You know, what was it about this film, about After Hours, that really drew you to choose it for Jews on Film? Because I would say off the bat, I didn't see any sort of recognizable, at least surface level cultural Jewishness in there. So so what made you choose this movie? Yeah, I know what you mean. It doesn't at all come off as a Jewish film and there's no like deep, but secretly it is. It's not. Right. But but it really reminds me of the time and place I was kind of just describing. And this movie came out in 1985, I think, when I would have been 13 years old, not living in New York anymore, but only a couple of years from when I moved from New York to Salt Lake City. I was still visiting New York a lot, staying with my uncle, my mother's 
brother is still on that Jewish, Jewish side of the family. And there's just something about the specific area where the film takes place, which is a lot of Soho, a little bit of Tribeca, but it's in the mid 80s when it was still a little bit desolate, a little bit not even dangerous, but like weird and quiet and kind of a lot of artists and creatives. And I remember seeing this movie then when it came out, I'm sure mm. with my uncle and kind of the ways that I understood Jewish culture from my family, really getting this neighborhood, really knowing where they were, knowing these specific blocks, knowing these streets. And the even funnier thing is I didn't realize until I just rewatched it that a lot of it takes place one block from my office now. Whoa. And I know the exact corner and it does not look like That's that cool, anymore. Right? But, but so for me, it was the connection to my childhood and that time and place when I was, you know, seeing my Jewish relatives all over New York and seeing movies like this. It all just kind of feels like it, it has the same theme. It all goes together for me. It's got me so excited to talk about the film, but you know what time it is, Harry. IMDb summary time. Hopefully by season three, our, our guests know what to expect. <laughs> They're screaming at home. They're like, IMDb summary time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, I'll get us going. So it's a quick one this week. It reads, uh, an ordinary word processor has the worst night of his life after he agrees to visit a girl in Soho whom he met that evening at a coffee shop. But that's it. <laughs> it's always so amazing how concise, like you're like, yeah, that's sort of like a, it's like a sketch of this movie. It doesn't right. even like begin to like dive into the craziness that is this. I film. was about to say it's, it's a good way to go into it because you have no idea, you know, worst night of his life. I don't think quite captures just the strangeness that happens, right. you know, to the second half. I would actually argue that maybe he also had the best night of his life Ooh. in some ways. There's there's definitely a sort of like a rebirth. You know, he experiences, you know, some of the world <laughs> that maybe he didn't have in his, you know, yeah, like yeah. closed off sheltered life. And this is, you know, treading on some of the sort of Jewish read. I think we'll, we'll start to have a little bit on the character and maybe <laughs> right. the, the more, you know, bookish kind of staying in type that he is at the beginning of the <laughs> right. movie. But I'm just teasing us before we get to the actual uh, discussion right after the break. I almost feel like this is the last night of his life, but you know, that's my like crackpot theory after going down this like rabbit hole of YouTube videos that are analyzing the end credits, like the last moments of the film. Right. There is. I didn't, I Googled it and I didn't read all the things and watch things, but apparently there's a lot of people talking about it and sort of, yeah, analyzing it, guessing what happens next, all that oh, kind yeah. of stuff. Right. I yeah. mean, there's like Grim Reaper stuff going on in the last frame of the film. It's very like, oh, wow. it's, it's very heady. <laughs> um, before we take a break, I do want to like actually, just kind of like place this film in the chronology of Martin Scorsese's kind of filmography, right? So this is 1985, as you mentioned, Nabil. This is kind of after he, I think his film right before this, or one of the films was like original, or The King of Comedy mm, with De Niro, is, and it didn't do so well. Right. And it wasn't like well received. And so it's a bit on a slump or on, on Scorsese's slump. He was trying to get this film, The Last Temptation of Christ made, and it didn't happen. And he got this sort of, uh, he, I was going to, about to say he got an email from Paramount or whatever, but they didn't have email. <laughs> he probably got, he got a phone a call. A pigeon, a letter from a pigeon <laughs> right. carrier. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it didn't come together. And so he decided to work with uh, Griffin Dunn, as well as like a former actress of his. She produced the film. Amy oh. Robinson and Griffin Dunn started this uh, production company, Double Play Productions. And so they worked with Scorsese to make this film. So, uh the film is actually written by someone called Joseph Minion, who was born in Teaneck. Shout out to Teaneck, uh, Harry. Uh, <laughs> cool. and, and it was his student thesis film or student thesis project. And it was inspired uh, largely by a Joe Frank monologue from NPR called Lies. So we'll put a link to that original story in the show notes oh. because kind of like listening to Joe Frank's monologue and then kind of like hearing the beginnings of the film, you know, a lot of it is very similar, um, so that will maybe help contextualize things. But uh, Griffin Dunn is our main character, and uh, previously he was in like American Werewolf in London and things like that. So before uh, Daniel, I saw you were about to cut to break. I'm going to cut you off one more time. Oh my We've been teasing this break now for like five minutes, but one more. I love what you said about this coming sort of while Scorsese was trying to get uh, sure. the Last Temptation of Christ off the ground. I, I think that's yeah. fascinating, and I think it really informs and supports, I think, a theory that I'm going to be pulling through oh. the film just about the way. That this movie, I think, deals with temptation and the way that it deals oh. with kind of the sin for, you know, oh, for some, wow. some gazing that I think we're going to see our main character does in the film. And I just when I learned that it was in the middle, because I, I had also read about that, that it happens while Scorsese's working on Last Temptation of Christ. I was like, for sure, he's working this into his movie. And that's kind of guiding, you know, a little bit of the, the tribulations, I would say, of, of the main character. So just want to set that up before we start. OK, 
Now, Nabil, we're about to go to break, but if there's anything you want to add to, for sure, <laughs> exactly. now would be the time. <laughs> I mean, just, I just remember when, when I Googled it, and I, again, I didn't read too much about it, but the first line I saw on one listing was, uh, you know, it was like in 1984, Martin Scorsese was box office poison. It's <laughs> just like that. That's apparently how bad the King of Comedy or or something else that came before that had done, which is incredible because I, I, you know, I mean, all greats have ups and downs. Sure. But I didn't realize that he was that down. Yeah, you, you can't imagine that today when like Netflix for the Irishman gave him, I don't know how much money, but a lot of money. He is <laughs> really? like as as dependable as it gets these days. So yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, I mean, he's done so many different things and people like pigeonhole him for this kind of movie or that kind of movie. But he's done movies like Hugo and he did like a Kurosawa film, like um, what's it called? Dreams or something like that. It was like a, an anthology of Kurosawa shorts or something like that. Right. Anyway, and he, if, if this is like this is right before his last temptation of Christ, the next thing he did. I'm going to look that up. Or was real there quick. something else before that? Because now I'm getting, of course, you know, I'm a music nerd, but mm -hmm. Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> yeah. when he made Nebraska, was kind of a rock superstar and wanted to make this quiet acoustic album. And right. I think reportedly told the label, like, look, just let me do this and then I'll give you a hit after this. I need to get this out of my system. And then sure. Born in the USA <laughs> was the record after that. So maybe this is, uh, this is Scorsese's Nebraska. So it was after hours, then color of money the the following year, and then and then eighty eight was T temptation of Christ. Wow. Okay. But so then after back. that, it was like New York stories, Goodfellas, Cape Fear, <laughs> Age of Innocence, boom, boom, boom. Oh boom, my boom. god! So, <laughs> right. Yeah. I do feel like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed this movie. So thank you for picking it. Um, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back where we'll jump into the plot and really get into it. Cause yeah, I'm too super excited. We'll be right. right back. Welcome back to Jews on film, our season three premiere. Our guest today is Nabil Ayers and we are discussing the film after hours by Martin Scorsese. Harry, would you like to get us kicked off? Let's do it. So uh, the movie opens, we're introduced to Paul Hackett. He's played by Griffin Dunn and we see him at work. He's bored. According to IMDb, he's a computer word processing consultant. You know, the way the way his job looked, I doubt it's relevant anymore. But back then, and he's basically he's working with a trainee trying to teach him how it's going. But, you know, critically, I think he's not paying attention at all. He's gazing about. We kind of follow this amazing camera work in that first scene. He's looking all over the, uh, you know, the sort of the, the office floor. And uh, and we just kind of meet him in that first day of work. Got to give a shout out to Bronson Pinchot from uh, <laughs> Perfect Strangers. Right. Is that is that right? Balky, Balky Bartokamus makes the, makes an early cameo in the film. Right. Yeah. I mean, I thought. uh I don't know what to make of his little speech where he's like, it's temporary anyway. Hmm? I said, it's temporary anyway. I do not intend to be stuck doing this for the rest of my life. Don't tell Mr. Dittman that I said that, please. Okay. Because what I really want to do is uh, I really like to get into publishing. I'm like, all right, buddy, just he's trying to help you out. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> right. Continue, Harry. He's so yeah. well. He's not really trying to help him out because he's not listening to it. Right, right? that's like true. He, that's he, true. You kind of hear that monologue as viewers, but right. it doesn't he's feel there. like. Uh, but Paul is listening. So, uh, anyways, just to get past that opening scene, Paul goes home after a long day. We see him. You know, he's reading a book. He's watching TV alone in his apartment, and eventually, he kind of gets up and goes to a coffee shop. And when he's there, he meets Marcy, and she's sitting, you know, a table over. She begins flirting with him, and eventually. She gives him a, she gives him his number and there's this great moment where he's trying to write it down, but his pen is dead. So he gets, you know, he, he runs around, tries to get a pen, writes it into his book. But eventually he has her number. He gets back home and late that night, it's I think it's around like 1045. And, you know, this being a one night movie, it's important to kind of situate ourselves as we go through it. But uh, he decides to call Marcy and eventually she invites him to her Soho apartment where her friend Kiki lives. Who And she kind of teases him that Kiki creates these paper mache sculptures. And if you need a paperweight, you can come on over and I'll. Uh, uh, and we'll get you on. And right. and yeah, and that kind of sets off the plot a little bit. Totally. And, and the important part <laughs> that I got, which is so funny, because I, I saw this movie when it came out and I've seen it probably a few times since, but I rewatched it recently to prepare for this. And that's so early in the film when Marcy tells him her friend makes plaster of Paris or paper mache 
paperweights of is it bagels and lox or bagels and cream cheese bagels and cream cheese yeah cream cheese, but either yeah. way it was hilarious because i knew going in I, in my head i'm like well, this is not a jewish film air quotes right but it has this connection to my childhood in this time and place and you sure. know this early line in the movie is sort of the most stereotypically jewish food you can have right. <laughs> a lot of this is going to be like subtext and be like okay i guess i could see this but like do we think that kiki is this sort of like disgruntled jew artist who's like like channeling her childhood by by making paper bagels. mache bagels and cream. Uh, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. This is a crackpot theory, but I feel or like. Do you yeah. think that Marcy was trying to reel Griffin in? Mm. Not Griffin. The uh, Paul. Griffin's the character that after again, Paul, right? Or was she right. trying to reel him in by making up this story? And who knows? Right. Maybe that was just something that would get him interested and get him to come downtown. Do we think Paul's a Jewish character? I mean, we could get into it, you know. You know, I, it's a it's a great question. I mean, I love this read. This is exactly the kind of thing that when we watch these movies for Jews on film, we we jump to. You know, bagel and cream cheese. Like that was that was oh. the perfect thing to kind of latch onto. <laughs> you know, I mean, the way I understand it, bagels and cream cheese are inextricably linked to you know New York City, especially, right. but sure. in a way because of the right, Jewishness right. of you know parts of New York City, and that's obviously right. intermingled. Right. So intention or not, I mean, that is if we're counting this as a sort of Jewish reference, I think it's fair to say that you know we spotted it. I kind of read. A, I kind of read Paul as looking like Martin Scorsese at the time, you know, kind mm. of the dark hair with like okay. the you know, sort of big hair features. Right. And, you know, that's a classic kind of trope of a, of a director, especially, you know, in a movie following just sort of one person on a journey, you know, right. casting themselves in it. I know Christopher Nolan is someone who's famously accused of doing that, you know, oh, for really? all his movies. There's, if you see like Inception, you know, there's sort of a lead character with blonde, you know, pulled back hair that looks ah. kind of exactly like Christopher okay. Nolan. Oh. So, so that's kind of where Damn I'm going it. with that read. And, and through that lens and through, you know, the rest of the sort of temptation and the struggling with his faith kind of things like we, right. we should mention this Martin Scorsese is a filmmaker who famously not in all of his movies but often incorporates themes of Catholic guilt and you know I mean last temptation of Christ right temptation and <laughs> sin and, and right. so just seeing that character experience that I just kind of read it a little bit as not quite autobiographical but just inserting himself into it so I didn't get quite the Jewish read on Paul but okay I don't I don't think it's a stretch to say that the bagel and cream cheese, you know, there is some Jewishness. Sure. In her and yeah, and then there was a, there's a, there's a level of neuroses that I think some people would certainly attribute to that that stereotype of the Jewish guy in New York. I, as I mentioned, I was as I was going down my like uh, YouTube rabbit hole and watching these like amazing video essays on this film, like they compare Paul, this man, compared to like other Scorsese men like De Niro and things like that, who are clearly like these alpha guys who go around drive taxis and like kill people and then you have paul who's kind of you know use the word like nebishy and like a little bit a nebish, right? yeah. yeah i mean he's like ma like masculinity in whatever form in this film is a big thing that i want to explore like masculinity mm -hmm. um and like the way that other men treat him and the way that other women treat him i think is like a but it's also interesting to compare Paul, uh, you know, to like characters like Travis Bickle and things like that. Not only am I convinced by the arguments you guys are making towards his Jewishness, I'll even add fuel to the fire. I mean, we, we spoke about this before, but sort of the bookishness of his character. I mean, mm -hmm. we've, we've literally at this point seen him in three scenes and he was holding a book in his apartment. He brought a book to the diner. Like we spoke about this at the end of our season in our season two finale. We were talking about the movie Book Smart and spoke about how, you know, if you were kind of classifying a sort of more traditionally Jewish you know, story mm -hmm. narrative, it would most likely involve someone staying inside, not necessarily going on the wild journey. Right. And, and that's certainly a place <laughs> that you could say, you know, this is where our character start, where Paul starts, like even when he does make the call to Marcy and says, and she says, can you come over tonight? He said, tonight like it's 1045, you know, right. I was right. done for that. I was just calling which, to, say which to me was like a classic, you know, day job, New York, right. Whatever corporate stooge working his job. Mm -hmm super cool downtown hipster artist like 1045 the night downtown had yet to even begin right. and the night uptown was totally over and he's on the right. upper east side too it was like seinfeld land right are they right, exactly. <laughs> you know? and, and it's funny <laughs> and it's funny you say that because i remember there's a scene later in the movie and you know we'll get to this but when he's talking to marcy and she says do you have to be up early tomorrow or do you have to be anywhere and he says no and now i'm realizing you know and again we'll get to this at the end of the movie but he goes straight back to work so clearly you know he did have to go back to work and he right, probably yeah. just wanted to and should have wanted to be cool. Yeah, right, 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 exactly. Right, right, right. He wanted to impress her and maybe himself yeah. a little bit. I, I said this, that that first shot, I think, where the, the camera's kind of waving around. I, I think, first of all, I think it's it's great filmmaking, of course. You know, not a, not a big take to say Martin Scorsese has a great tracking shot in this film. But I do think that 
we get a lot about his character when I, like we mentioned, he was, you know, when uh, Paul is, is explaining to his coworker, you know, the stuff and the coworkers going on about this random monologue. And you just kind of see Paul, we, the camera takes on this sort of POV and, and we watch as he's just wavering around and taking in everything. And he's very unfocused. And, you know, I said, I was going to kind of trail this through the film, but I think that the film, and we'll see it in some later scenes, kind of criticizes and punishes him for this sort of wavering gaze that he he looks where he's not supposed to he's supposed to be this this sort of bookish indoor person and all of a sudden he's he has this sort of morbid curiosity and i wouldn't call it morbid in that first scene but as the movie goes on i'll make sure to keep pointing out that i think he looks where he's not supposed to and part of what happens to him later might be some punishment for that i think there's an interesting thing when you mentioned that when bronson pinchot the actor is kind of saying well i'm not planning on being here for a while i'm just you know trying to get to the next thing or whatever he says i think that that's part of that whole thing that that our main character maybe has been in that job for a while mm. and is sick of doing this thing where he has to keep yeah. training the new person who probably moves up. And right. I don't think it's that he's not, maybe I'm really making this up now, but he's just in that he's just stuck in this job. It's fine. He's getting paid. He's not trying to move up, but it's annoying to keep training these people. And he just doesn't care. And he's not right. paying attention. He's looking for something else, literally in that scene, looking for anything else. Oh, nice. Right. Very cool. I, like I love that. it. You're getting the hang of the podcast, pulling stuff out of thin air. I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, you know, uh, one of the things, Harry, you mentioned was like the, the camera work. I, I read somewhere that, you know, Scorsese's use of the of the wandering camera and the sort of kinetic movements is sort of like an homage to like Hitchcock and some of his kind of kind of camera flying all over the place. I think, you know, certainly we see it in the next scene uh, where he's taking a taxi and the taxi kind of like zooms all over the place. Uh, and it's it's just, it's craziness. So he basically hails a cab back in the day where cabs used to take cash. Uh, that was a thing, uh, kids. Uh, you know, he would, he, he got into the cab, he goes downtown um, and he puts the $20 bill that he has, his only $20 bill, he puts it in this little tray and I feel like he could have just like closed it to kind of end this sort of issue, but it flew out the window and there's this sort of like comic, <laughs> you know, the, the, the money just like flies away. Uh, so he, the, you know, he gets dropped off downtown and he tells the cab driver that he doesn't have the money and the driver, you know, remember that face, it might show up later, but uh, the cab driver drives off really pissed off and he gets to, uh, you know, Kiki's apartment. She throws the keys down at him. He lets himself up. And I believe, you know, he's trying to look for the buzzer. He eventually finds it and he comes in to find Kiki, who's played by Linda Fiorentino. Uh, she's doing uh, this sort of paper mache sculpture of a of a man kind of like trapped like this uh, again, audio medium only. So people can't see my amazing <laughs> space work here, but uh, you know, she asks for his help, you know, at that point he's wearing, it's important to, for me to note out that he's wearing a beige suit, a white shirt and a red tie. It's a bit Miami vice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds totally. like uh, you know, his entire apartment, all beige, all flat white. He's got some hockey right. posters up on the wall with a little bit of color, but overall he's kind of like a bland vanilla sort of dude compared to these very cool downtown artists who tend to all wear black. You know, we're, we're each working on our little, uh, our themes here, but I feel like, you know, one of the themes is, is sort of this uptown versus downtown artist versus, you know, consumer of artists versus creator of artists. You know, everyone's trying to be an artist downtown. Even the cashier at the restaurant is trying to be a ballet dancer and he's like, <laughs> shows off his moves to him when you're around so many people who are trying to be something else they want to show you how awesome they are at doing that other thing instead of actually sometimes just <laughs> right. doing their job and giving you the pen um uh, paul goes and he meets up with kiki after he helps her a little bit marcy comes over and uh, they go over to a diner the first of many of the night and they start talking about marcy's situation which is, you know, it's it's a bit strange, but then they do start talking about The Wizard of Oz. You've seen the film, haven't you? The Wizard of Oz? Yeah, I've seen it. Well, when we made love, whenever he, you know, when he came, he'd just scream out, surrender Dorothy. That's all. Just surrender Dorothy. <laughs> wow. Oh, instead of moaning or saying, oh, God, or something normal like that. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty creepy. <laughs> and I, I told him I thought so, but he just, he just couldn't stop. He just, he just couldn't stop. He just couldn't stop. Very strange discussion, but like sort of par for the course at this point. So they go back to, you know, to Marcy's afterwards. And this is, again, lifted verbatim from that initial monologue by Joe Frank. They talk about, you know, Marcy was raped before and it gets pretty heavy. 
uh, she talks about the circumstances surrounding it. And uh, he gets Paul gets a, a joint from Marcy and they smoke it. And he says it's not even Colombian weed, which is what she claimed it was. So, um, you know, I wonder there's all these theories online, but like maybe that's it at this point. This is sort of the string theory where like his reality has changed. And a lot of this is maybe his perception because he's had this non Colombian joint. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, wow. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's already, there's already been so many great New York moments at this point in the film right. and we're not that far in, but like even the cab ride, as he mentioned, is like this it's like a parody like it's in fast right. motion it's a cab yeah, flying yeah. down these streets and right. he's getting thrown around like it's truly it's almost like a cartoon of what you you know what the audience should think a cab ride is like in new york city <laughs> in the 80s right. yeah. yeah and then and that's like obviously like a very relatable new york moment for anybody but then to me the thing where she throws the keys down for uh, her, which, uh -huh. which was such a common thing then. And I think still is even now in some places. Right. That was a very common New York thing in a lot of places where the buzzer doesn't work. Come yep. to the window. I'll toss the keys down. You let yourself in and come up. That, mm -hmm. I love that moment, even as a kid, because I remember doing that. That whole sequence is like, it's the beginning of, I think, the first. And Daniel, you mentioned some of his, you know, Paul's relationship with some of the women he meets, because there's a couple of them throughout the night. And this is oh, yeah. the first one where a sort of strange dynamic unfolds. I mean, you yeah. get this sense that, you know, Paul also, you know, it's late at night. He kind of probably wants to go there for some quick sex, you know, hang out with her and then kind of move on with his night. And and things just become, and, and maybe that's not the read that everyone else had, but I think that things just become progressively a little bit more complicated, you know, with the Kiki thing. And then they kind of leave and he sort of gets this read of mercy that you know she's just i think she has she's she becomes a little bit emotional a little bit unexpected she talks in different ways and i think when things really start to turn as things get a little bit heavier because then she talks about you know her relationship with i think it was either her husband or maybe a past boyfriend who you know had one time came into her uh, like came into her sort of window climbed up her fire escape and according to her she says that he he raped her for six hours and then she says that she was asleep for most of it but right. she kind of says it both nonchalantly but then also very emotionally and you kind of see it on paul's face that he's becoming overwhelmed with this information sure. and that and i think that starts to spark you know what i was sort of throwing up before a little bit of that you know morbid curiosity he has mm -hmm. and that's when we kind of start to see you know he see, she goes to the bathroom and then she kind of he, he, he goes through her stuff right and he sees that she has this sort of burn cream in there oh, and he becomes yeah. a little bit you know confused and then later on he kind of sees that under you know her robe he starts to see what looks like and that we're led to believe i think in the beginning is the beginnings of a burn mark and you mm -hmm. kind of associate it with the rape and there's just a lot of, of strangeness going on here that piques his curiosity and the, the one other thing i do want to mention before we move on from the scene is that this scene also features you know and this is really what i'm going to cast my my whole theory around and then and then we can you know make space for some other ideas but yes <laughs> We have that incredible scene where he tells the story about his experience getting his tonsils removed when he was 12 years old. Paul tells mm -hmm. this story to Marcy, who honestly, if I remember correctly, isn't really listening to him. No, but she falls asleep. The, oh, right. She falls asleep. Oh, right, right, he tells right, the story. Right. But, but I, I leaned in because in a moment when, you know, a character is going through a story of their past and we're kind of locked on them, it, it's, it's kind of telling you, you know, sit up. This and is important. To this. Yeah, exactly. And he tells this great story about how when he when I was a kid. I had my tonsils taken out. And uh, after the operation, they didn't have enough room in pediatrics, so they had to put me in the burn ward. Well, before they wheeled me in, this nurse gave me this, this blindfold to put on. And she told me never to take it off. But if I did, I'd have to do the operation all over again. <laughs> I, I didn't understand what my tonsils had to do with my eyes either, but anyway, that night, at least I think it was night, I reached up to untie the blindfold. And the story cuts off right there. And right. that's it. And that's mm. all we get from it. And we kind of move on. Right. And, 
It's one of my favorite film film moves ever when you get half a story and you're dying to know what happened. Uh, yeah. I love, I love and that. And it's that same. And I think what it does for us as viewers is it gives us that same sense of the morbidly curious, because what did he see? I mean, he probably saw, you know, awful disfigurements and burns mm-hmm. and just terrible stuff. Like what we know what's coming, but we want so desperately for him to finish the story. And I think it really yeah. mirrors what he ends up doing, you know, sort of peeking at the burn cream. Cause I think it comes a little bit before then. And he's peeking at what he thinks is the sort of burn on her legs. And it mm-hmm. just introduces this curiosity. And I think that kind of is what keeps him there for the rest of the night. Because of course there are many times and we'll talk about them, you know, with the subway fare and, <laughs> you know, getting kicked out of the taxi where he's really trying to go home. But I think there's part of him that can't leave because he's, he's sucked into this, you know, the, this right. underbelly of Soho, he's kind of stuck there. And, you know, because he can't help himself, he's taking off his blindfold. He has to gaze at, you know, the quote unquote, the burn victims. He has to gaze at, you know, what's going on in this world. I think in a very, and I'm, I'm going into already the religiousness now, but I think in a very religious sense, he's, he's, he commits that sort of sin of looking at too much and and he's kind of punished for that later on. And I, I think visually there's just a lot going on there. At this point in the movie, there's already a bit of like careful what you wish for. It's, you know, right. the, he, he thinks he's going down there for like a quick hookup or a fun night. And it's already so right. complicated and oh, dark yeah. and weird. And he's dealing with people that he obviously doesn't really trust, but he's in their apartment. And it's yeah, it's it's a lot more than he asked for. And it's already like 1.30 a.m. Like at some right. point, like she says, like, let's go to right. a diner. And he's like, There's right. a, like, would there be a diner open? And she <laughs> says, it's not even two yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he starts out this movie as this sort of like yuppie scum kind of character like this, just to uh, to contextualize this as well. Like, like this falls in the category of like yuppie nightmare cinema. So I feel like other movies that I would put into this category might be things like American Psycho. Mm -hmm. Where it's like a similar, like a yuppie guy and does all this horrific stuff and sort of, you know, he's this kind of like, we would call it now like a douchey guy, you know, at the beginning of the film where he's like less sympathetic for me, at least he's trying to hook up with Kiki as he's telling her the story and then she like falls asleep on him and then he goes and he tries to meet Marcy and like, you know, initially he's going down there to meet up with Marcy, but he'll be like, oh, Kiki's here and she's in a bra. Let's 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 hang out. Let's hook up, whatever. And so I think as he, you know, progresses through the film, we see that he changes quite a bit, you know, in his costume, quite literally, you know, and all this there's all this stuff going on. But I just wanted to flag that as well. I think at this point, does Marcy fall asleep and then he decides to leave? He asks her, where are those plaster of Paris paperweights anyway? I mean, that's what I came down here for in the first place. Well, that's not entirely true. I came to see you. But where are the paperweights? That's what I want to see now. He gets pretty <laughs> pissed off, right? And I think it's it's both like a culmination of just the strangeness of the night right. and what he's been encountering. Yeah, but yeah. also maybe partially because, like you said, he's you know smoked a little bit. He's probably in a different headspace. But he has a very aggressive and shocking yeah. sort of outburst and just says, right. I came here like he, he's fed up. It's, it's two in the morning. He's ready to go home. And he says, I'm fed up. You, you promised me a paperweight. Where is the paperweight? I mean, that's and code for like something else, I think, you know? Yeah, but as soon, <laughs> well, as soon as she goes up to get it, he, he runs he out. He disappears, right. Yeah, oh, but that all, that also might have been. I mean, I guess we're analyzing the film, right? But that might be his way of okay. I didn't get to hook up with anyone, but I don't want to make it clear that that's why I came down ah, here. So right. I'm going to really lean into this thing that I totally. ostensibly came down here to do. Right. I came here because your friend's an artist, and I came to buy art. Right. As, Which as is obviously not true, and why right. he's pissed off about it. Yeah. And, and right. exactly. And before she can even bring it back, you know, he uses he that as, as an opportunity to, yeah. you know, slip out. It's, it's kind of like the pre, you know, iPhone version of ghosting someone. He kind right, of just right. slips and that, out. And that's when the movie really begins, yes. kind of. When he, he, he becomes. Yeah. Instead of a backseat driver, he's taking the the front seat and becoming like an active uh, participant in this night. Uh, You know, so he leaves. He's getting soaked up in the rain. I believe at this point he has changed because he did paper mache. Kiki has given him a black shirt now. So he's got his white, you know, his beige jacket on, his uh, black shirt on and a red tie. Uh, You know, so something has changed at this point. Quite, you know, figured uh, literally right. with his clothing, but also just I think that, like you said, Nabil, the movie takes a turn here. You know, he goes out, he gets to the subway and has I believe he's just he has 97 cents. And because it's past midnight, <laughs> it's now up to a dollar fifty. Oh, man, what I wouldn't do for like a dollar fifty subway fare. Uh, <laughs> and that, and, that, and that's to buy a token. Don't right. forget. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, go to, right. you used to go to the booth. You give the person money and you buy a subway token. Then you put the token in the machine and you could buy, you know, 
whatever groups of tokens or numbers of tokens or right. a token and he was trying to buy a token I mean, exactly. that, that scene was just like so rough that, you know, he's got 97 cents. The guy's not willing to lend him or give him 50 cents. He's like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I could lose my job. Well, who would who would know exactly? I could go to a party, get drunk, talk to someone. Who knows? Would you just give me a goddamn token? No, God damn it. I cannot give you a token. I'm like, that's classic New York bullshit where no one's going to help you out because it means that they could get, you know, and then seeing the train leave. That's sorry. One second. I got to vent my frustration here. I have I've been holding this in for so long. I mean, I left New York and I'm like happy with the light rail in Seattle. It's great. You know, but like I, I feel like there's nothing worse on like a on a night on a late night when you just see the train that you're wanting to go, you know, very far distance. And you just see it leave and you're just like, yeah, it's going to be another 40 minutes or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Especially late at night when it's not running every five minutes anymore. Well, and it's he also, every... but he also, he, the train comes and he hops the turnstile, and right. there happen to be some cops he tries right to. there. Like, right. Well, it's just, you know, a, the comedy of errors. Like, right. everything's like, going wrong for this guy. Just, he can't get a break. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I wanna, and I want to, you know, you called it a comedy of errors. Like, underrated, you know, with Scorsese in this film, it's very funny. And I was going to mm. say, what are the best lines, you know, when he's talking to the, when he's trying to get, he's like, just give me the extra 50s or give me the token. You know, no one's going to know. And the guy says, well, he goes, I might go to a party. I might get drunk. It might slip out you know you never know someone might find out about this and it's so ridiculous and so funny and like you're saying daniel it's just you know i'm not gonna help you and it's just it's classic new york it's a very fun oh, you know, like yeah. the night would have been over he could have just gone on the subway gone home and none of the rest of the film would have happened but then we wouldn't have a good movie obviously yeah it's rough so he ends up he goes to a diner but then he goes to or he goes to a bar and this is sort of the rock bar across the street and we have oh, the, the punk play. yeah yeah right. yeah and we have um, John Hurt and Terry Gar as uh, it's a very like sort of minimal bar. There's the bartender kind of cleaning up a little bit. We have our waitress in this sort of like go-go 60s outfit. And then we have this sort of lone couple dancing, sort of just doing their thing. I feel like that's like setting up, you know, visual symmetry for the end where he is sort of dancing with uh, with Juliet or with um, – What's who's the person? At, there's someone at the end as well that he dances with before he gets, you know, right. spoiler alert, you know, encased in plaster. But, uh, you know, I think at this point he's That's still tr- tr- was that June. Thank you. Uh, June. He's just kind of like reeling from his loss here and kind of just wanting to sit. I think he said, I just want to sit down. I just want to relax. I think he's just trying to get, get, you know, sorry, I'm still coming down off of my subway frustration rant. So apologies. <laughs> apologies. And isn't there the weird line where Terry Gar is sitting there and the bartender, like right. he notices Terry Gar and the bartender says, you know, if you're interested, you better act fast because we're closing right. or something like that, uh, which is, yeah, yeah. which is sort of pretty creepy and weird <laughs> yeah, thing to bit. say, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's also over her job, right? She comes over to his yeah. like later on. She's like, oh, yeah, I'm I'm done with this job. Oh, she, right. She leaves him the, uh, the the bill and she writes on the back. You right. know, I, I hate it here. I want to leave. You know, I want to quit. <laughs> I think he just had like a glass of water or something like that. Nothing, you know, nothing. Well, he has too no exciting. money, right? right? He lost his twenty dollars. He's got ninety seven cents in his pocket. Not yeah. much left for him to do. So uh, so he goes to the diner. And then the big thing that kind of happens there is he's talking to the bartender. Right. And he says to him, like, you know, I can't even get back. I don't have a dollar fifty. Like, did you know that? Like they changed the subway? And he's like, yeah, I knew that happened tonight. <laughs> and he uh, and he says, like, can I get a dollar fifty? And the bartender's like, sure, like I can. Right. But before he's about to give it to him, he tries to like get it from the cash register and it's not opening. So then he says, you know, I have a key, but it's in my apartment. Mm. And he he basically ends up sending Paul up to his apartment to get his key. And, you know, Paul, he says, he goes, I need you to go to my apartment. And when you're there, can you actually check to see if there's an alarm going off? Because I heard there's a bunch of robberies happening tonight. And Paul's like, sure, I can check that. But he says, but yeah, I, he goes, how do you know I'm not the robber? So he basically does this deal where he says, I'll give you my home keys and I'll mm-hmm. take your home keys, you know, to the bartender and I'll go up there and check for the alarms. So he goes to the bartender's apartment. He checks the alarm, finds the key, no problem. He then just stops in the bathroom where it's another one of those like stops overstaying your welcome. And he learns this lesson as the night goes on, but he, he gets yeah, distracted, yeah. wipes his face because he's all, you know, rained on throws his tissues into the toilet, flushes it. And of course it overflows. And he doesn't seem like the guy who's going to try to figure this out at this point. He's like, 
let me just get out of here, get my keys and go. This is someone else's problem. And he tries to leave the apartment. But then all of a sudden, there's a bunch of tenants in the building that, you know, echo what the bartender said and said, you know, there's been like five robberies in our building alone tonight. How do we know you're not the, ro- the you know, the robber? And he can't really claim. He says, oh, I got this from, you know, Tom, the bartender or whatever his name is. And they say, mm-hmm. well, which Tom? There's three Toms right. here. Right. And we get into this whole mess where this is the first time Paul is kind of accused of being the, you know, the thief that night. But anyways, he manages to get out of the apartment. And as he's walking home, he sees the actual thieves who are played by, you know, the famous Cheech and Chong, there you you know, the famous duo. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that was a spot that I did recognize, you know, unlike the guy you guys were talking about at the beginning. Uh-huh. And, uh, and he sees that they're actually they're like loading a TV into the back of their van. And then also the sculpture that Paul recognizes he had seen that Kiki was working on earlier when he was there. So this kind of, you know, he re- first of all, he recognized that these are the actual thieves, but then also says, they stole from this apartment, you know, I need to go back and check on all of a sudden he feels very protective over, you know, Kiki and Marcy. So that sends him back to Kiki and Marcy's apartment. And when he gets there, he sees Kiki come kind of out the window, all tied up and he gets very nervous. He says, throw down the keys, runs up. And it turns out she wasn't actually robbed by them. She's like, oh, and I, f- I forget their names, but she's like, oh yeah, they, I just sold them my TV for $300 and I gave them right. a sculpture. And, and the reason she was tied up was because she was just doing some, you know, BDSM. She was just, you know, in the middle of a night with her boyfriend and that was it. So he kind of goes there and he that's where he starts to talk about how he feels bad for, you know, what we called sort of ghosting Marcy. He's like, I kind of ran out. wasn't so nice. She was all emotional. And then, you know, Kiki says, if you want to make her up, you know, make up for it. She's right in there. Just go talk to her. So he goes into her room and that's where he discovers that, you know, Marcy has OD'd and he kind of sees that there's a bottle of sleeping pills in her hand. And he recognizes that because of the events of the night and he definitely feels some responsibility, she must have OD'd on sleeping pills. And before he rushes to tell anyone or do anything, and this I thought was pretty important his sort of morbid curiosity overtakes him and he takes the robe he slightly pulls the robe off of her that she's wearing just to see the kind of burns that he had you know that we had been teased to in the beginning of the movie and when he pulls up her leg it's just a tattoo and not only is it a tattoo but it's the same skull tattoo as are on the keys of the bartender that he kind of had the keys from and he kind of recognizes it i think the camera you know that the movie shows us them to put that together and we'll see why that's relevant (laughs) later but anyways he sees she's ods checks out her body and then uh, runs out to tell Kiki about it. But he sees a note saying that Kiki and her boyfriend had left. They've gone to the club Berlin and now he's on his own with a dead body in this apartment and doesn't know what to do. Right. It's a lot that you covered. A few things I wanted to call out. Wanted to shout out Cheech Marin as a Cal State Northridge alum. Want to do that where I can, you know. And uh, what else was there? There's so much that you covered, Harry. So thanks for doing that. I think the, <laughs> it's also funny that the uh, Kiki's boyfriend's name is Torst. Just like a fun <laughs> shout out. Like such a Torst. such a like a Nordic, like strong guy. I think we see him later in the film. He's like this really big dude with like black sort of see through outfit and, and things. Things like that. Um, now, Nabil, you know, in in your time, did you ever go to like a, a kind of a Club Berlin sort of place? I was too young. All that stuff was around then, but I was a kid, so I knew about it. My uncle wasn't really into that kind of stuff. He was, you know, he was a jazz musician, but I mean, right. he, I think he did go to all those places. They were all within walking distance of his apartment on Canal Street. We went to the Ear Inn a lot because that was one of the only like restaurants in the neighborhood at the time. Mm-hmm. It's still there. Um, and I actually, in my head, they'd spent a lot of time at the ear in this film, but actually looking at it now, I don't think it's ever actually in the movie. It's always just in the surrounding areas. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I never went to any of those places. I remember what the streets looked like. I remember seeing them. All the people look incredibly accurate to me. And that's what I remember people <laughs> looking like in that part of New York in 1985. So much fun. And how about like maybe on your days as a drummer for all the bands that you were in, like did you ever play like these kind of places where Scorsese was maybe hanging out doing a cameo? Right. Or anything like that, I, don't, you know? I don't think so. I mean, by the time I was in bands, I mean, the first time I would have, I lived in Seattle then actually for a long time. The first time I would have toured through New York would have been like 1995, mm-hmm. which was already, you know, 10 years later, a pretty different yeah. time. We definitely played at CBGB's once, but even then nice. that wasn't like, that wasn't dangerous. That was just, right. you know, CBGB's in 1995 was totally fine. Um, and like Mercury Lounge, like a lot of places in the Lower East Side, but nothing mm-hmm nothing like desolate or crazy. I mean, that's what's so wild about this neighborhood is that, and they did such a good job of portraying it. I mean, the streets, there's so much silence in this movie when they're outside, when they're just like walking around the streets, you don't hear a thing. And I think that's like, that's not what people think of as parts of New York city, but that part at the time was really that it was just completely quiet at night. There's nothing going on. No one was driving around. No one needed to be there. You wouldn't run into people, but it wasn't dangerous. It was just empty. Right. 
It's wild. Yeah. To think about it now where it's like so different and so <laughs> yeah. developed and so bougie and things like that. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's quite different. So nobody I mean, tried to give you a Mohawk, what you're saying. No one tried to give me a Mohawk. Oh, wait, but there is one little thing not to go backwards, but I forgot early on when he first shows up at the apartment, Kiki's on the phone. To, it's Marcy, right? It's Rosanna Arquette. Yeah. Uh, Kiki's on the phone to Marcy and it's something like you can only hear Kiki. And she's like, yeah, your friend is here. Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't know. What do you want me to do? He's just here, you know, like this very <laughs> yeah. it's like you don't even hear it, but you know she's on the other side of the line saying, like, what why the hell did he come down there? Oh, he actually come. You, can, right. you can see that he yeah. feels that. So it already starts the sort of anxiety starts the second he walks in the door. Right. Ugh. Totally. I, I also like I like what you were talking about, sort of New York at night and just the way that it's so dead. I mean, we didn't even talk about the movies called After Hours. And right. they mentioned it right. at some point in like the diner. I think one of the people says, like, you know, your meal is is like completely comped, you know, after hours, that's just, right. that's just how things work kind of thing. And it's just like, it's, it feels like it's society, you know, is gone. Like we open the movie and he's in this very bustling, you know, office. And like you, Danny, you were talking about the very kinetic energy of the camera moving around. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden at night, things just really slow down. And there are scenes yeah. that are more eventful, you know, we'll, we'll get to that scene in the club Berlin later. And that's just sure. definitely, it, it amps up the energy that there's a raucousness to it, but <laughs> there's a real like quietness of this is what happens, you know, after night, this is, this is, the other side of kind of normal society, so to speak. You know, so after this happens and he discovers that Marcy is dead, I think he does what any upstanding gentleman would do. He calls the cops. Um, and then I believe he leaves like a note that says like dead body. And he just like yeah. has a series of like, rather than stick around for the cops to show up, he just leaves some notes and then he just like bounces. I think, you know, he tries to go back to the diner to get his keys because He's already gotten the key from the bartender's house after flooding the guy's toilet. And just, I mean, we'll see what happens when the guy gets back to his place. But, you know, he goes back to the bar and the bar is closed. But the waitress, Julie, uh, sees him kind of leaving. She's got her sort of like clear, sort of like 1960s umbrella. She's very into that. And she lives right across the street. So he goes and back. She just to quit her job. Right. She said, I did it. I did it. I finally quit. All right. right. Great. Uh, they go back and they start listening to the monkeys and they kind of like hang out. And she's kind of she's sort of this like bohemian artsy kind of person, another type of person that lives downtown uh, in this era. And she's like very, you know, nostalgia, I feel like works in like 20 year shifts. Right. So this is 85. Okay. So maybe she's nostalgic for like the mid 60s. Uh, she's got sure. the sort of go go outfit. That sort of weird like tie necklace thing that she had like that beaded thing. Her whole apartment is very, uh, you know, 60s themed and they chat a little bit. But I, I feel like every time he connects or attempts to connect with a woman in this film, it just doesn't seem to work like, you know, Kiki's like very like brash and like tough and She's like too much for him. He's got this sort of like beta energy, you know, and and like Marcy is like married and also has a boyfriend, as we find out in a second. And, and is now dead. And is now dead. So she's <laughs> she's off the table, you know, right. and then and then we go to Julie, who like is clicking with him, but he's just not into it. I think he's maybe just like too distracted. At this point, he's just trying he's trying to get home. Right. Yeah. I think he's home. seeing her as more of like. She can help me get home. I don't have any money. I'm stuck down here. Right. I need that's what I need from her. But she's yeah, she's wanting to engage with him. And she, he's like a little short with her because he's like, I'm done. I'm not mm -hmm. into this, you know, and I think she she starts sketching him because she's an artist as well as being, a you know, being a waitress, but also an artist. Another one of those. And uh, so then he goes back, I think, because he sees Tom come back. So he goes back to the apartment after hanging out for like half an hour. He goes back. He says, I'll be right back. So then he comes back to the bar. He gives Tom his keys uh, and he's about to give him the money. But then the phone rings and then the bartender gets a phone call and discovers that his girlfriend has just OD'd and died. And Paul is like looking at himself just like totally not that he's responsible, but he's just like trying to play it off cool so that he doesn't, you know, uh, yeah, tip off. Just, just get uptown. You don't want to be involved. Just get right. out of here. This is not your mess. <laughs> yeah. Just get yeah. out of here. And, and, and he and he feels guilty and right and guilty. And we'll talk about sort of guiltiness, the Jewish guilt, the Catholic guilt, whatever you want to call it. And he mm -hmm. says, I can't I just left a woman in her apartment, another woman in her apartment. I just told her that I would be back. And that kind of spawns him like before he can get the money, because at this point, Tom is too distracted. He says, I need to go run back to that apartment and just 
you know, see, you know, just check in on her and make sure, I mean, morbidly that she doesn't kill herself like this other person who did. And it's just, you know, you can feel the anxiety there. Yeah. So he's back to Julie's house across the street and then back to Tom's house to see that he can't get his keys because then he realizes he doesn't have his keys. And, uh, you know, I think he um, he goes back. Go ahead. What was it you say, Harry? Yeah, it might be keys. It might just be the money at that point. I think he wants he the money from the bartender. Yeah, because he still didn't get the dollar right. fifty. So now once he's checked in on her and she's right. okay, he tries to go back. I'm gonna go and back. Again, the shop is closed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's I feel like that's sort of like, you know, that's classic sort of like small bar business. Like I live across the street. I'm just gonna go right. back in fifteen. Yeah. Exactly. You you want to drink note. tough shit, that's your problem. It's not my problem. I'll be back soon. I mean, the even funnier part is the idea of the note on this, you know, whatever weekday night at whatever yeah. time it is right. when no one's there anyway. The concept that you yeah, right. put up a note. <laughs> Paul runs back to the diner to get his t- keys, but Tom is gone. And l- and last time Tom was missing, Tom told him I wasn't here because I ran back to my apartment to see if you were robbing him. So right. now he says, Okay, I'm gonna go to Tom's apartment so I can see him there. But he tries to go there, and that's when the mob sees him and says, There he is again. That's the guy right. from before. He's back yeah. to rob the place. And that's when the mob starts to form around him. And now he has to get out of there. He doesn't have his dollar fifty. He's right. not getting it from Tom. And that's when Paul decides, let me just go to you know Club, Club Berlin. Berlin. I, right. I think at that point it's both to just check in with you know Kiki about her friend Marcy. He kind of feels this overwhelming guilt, and maybe sure. those are his only allies at this point. You know, Kiki's the only person that was somewhat reasonable with him in, in Soho that night. He needs someone to give him the money. Like he he cannot get out for the life of him. And I just that that scene specifically in the diner when Tom is about to hand him the dollar fifty and gets the call, and it's just oh, it's painful. It's just, just him, take the money. <laughs> you have the key. You just need to get out. And you know. I, I don't know if this is an experience. I mean, I, I think other people have had like this, but this really just felt to me like those dreams that you have. And maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just outing myself in my strange dreams, but where like you're just, you're in a location and you're just trying to do something and you're just trying to get out and you don't understand why you can't. And it's just endless. And it, you're, you just feel like stuck. And, and I think that there is such a dreamlike quality to this film. I think that fits the frame that you had, Daniel, with sort of like the smoking and just kind of the out of his own mind and just everything we're talking about just being stuck there. And I was just like, at this point, I was like, like it feels like you're just trapped in that dream where you just don't know what's going on and you cannot leave. And I mean, the movie itself at this point becomes a real off the rails fever dream. You know, sure. once he's getting chased around the mob, going to Club Berlin, you know, we're going to cover all the, la- the, the minutia, but it just gets completely surreal from this point forward. I'm going to posit a theory here and we can touch on it later in the theme section, but I feel like there's a strong case to be made that he's dying or, and like he's going to hell or heaven. And this is his sort of limbo, his journey on the river sticks as it were, you know? (laughs) So he's like meeting all these like demons and characters and like otherworldly people. And then he finally ascends to these pearly gates at the end, all covered in white. Um, that's my, you know, there's definitely a, a read, you know, obviously subtextual. This is, you know, plot based. He goes back to work, whatever. But if you wanted to, you could make that case. I think um, sure. I want to get to the, you know, the next scene where he goes to the Club Berlin, Club Berlin. Yeah. and he shows up in his sort of wet suit, black shirt, kind of looking like a yuppie who's out of his element, trying to go to this very cool place. And like the way that the bouncer talks to him is not sort of typical bouncer banter. I can't let you in at the moment. Will it be possible to be uh, admitted uh, at a more convenient time for the club? It is possible, but not at the moment. If you're so drawn to it, try and force your way in. Got any money? Yes, I have money. Is that what you want? Money? Why didn't you just ask for that in the first place, man? Here, it's it's not much, but it's all I've got. I'll take your money, because I don't want you to feel you left anything untried. You keep the quarter. You still have to wait a few minutes. Like the guy with the mohawk just goes straight in, and then he decides to barter with him that he's going to get a mohawk and then go in. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I think uh, that whole scene is just very like, he's very out of his element. So he says, if I agree to get shaved into a mohawk, will you let me in? Thinking that he could just say yes, go in and, you know, find Kiki. Instead, the guy drags him all the way through to someone who right. holds like a, a shaver to his head. And we'll just mention that this, whatever, the, the Club Berlin scene is when we see the uh, the Martin Scorsese cameo. He's operating a sort of big light and, yeah. you know, just whatever. Just, just wanted to point that out. 
He runs out of this club after kind of getting his head shaved off. As he's going out, he tries to tell Kiki he likes you, mounts to her, you know, Marcy's dead. And, right, right. You know, I'm being, you know, whatever. <laughs> I need money. And and she kind of, it, it's implied that she misses all of it. So uh, so he runs out and he ends up seeing the, uh, or I think it was either then or maybe earlier, he had seen the sculpture that Kiki mm-hmm. had made on the side of the road. And we learned that she made it by, you know, paper mache $20 bills onto it. So at some point he grabs the $20 bill and puts it into his pocket. So he's, you know, going down and he sees the cab driver and it's actually the cab driver that we saw earlier. And he waves him down and he says, look, look, I have money now. Like, can you take me uptown? And the cab driver, and it was, he made a mistake by, Paul made a mistake by hold, waving the yeah. money in the cab driver's face because the cab driver rips it out of his hands and says see how that feels and just drives away with it right. which is uh you know just another gut punch after the end of Very a long new night. york too another new york moment yeah yeah exactly classic new york cab driver this guy never yeah. disappoints if that was today and it was uber he would get a very low star rating but such a you know accountability did not exist in, in those days so he's just no like question. f you i think gail is getting out of the cab Right. Yes. So that's, and that's when he meets Gail, who's played right. by Catherine O'Hara, recognizable. Oh. Um, and that's when she kind of also invites him up to her place. And again, at this point, Paul is just looking for a way to get home and maybe a way to get shelter. I think when mm-hmm. he's up there, he even says, I just need to sleep. Like, I just need right. a place. He's, he's done with the night. So Gail takes her up and he says he's going to call one of his friends that he knows the number by heart. And Gail is just, <laughs> she just starts spewing numbers <laughs> out and just like in an attempt to trip him up. And right. he's just incredulous. He's like, can I please just say this number? And she's right. like, four, seven, nine. And then he goes, great. I forgot the number. And again, he's just stuck there. So uh, so he's stuck and he complains and he tells her what his whole plight is. And she says, do you want me to drive you uptown? Like, I have an this ice cream it. truck. I've, I've got a I Mr. Drive Softy. A Mr. Softy to- <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is so absurd. We're, we're in the realm of ridiculousness at yeah. this point. And yeah. she says, great, I will drive you home. I'll take you up in my truck. And it all seems like it's going well. And again, she's they're walking towards the truck. They just need to so get close. in and go uptown. Down. And all of a sudden she stops by a lamppost and kind of pulls off, you know, this right. note and she's staring at it and you see in her face, she's getting suspicious and he doesn't get what's going on. And all of a sudden he kind of, kind of Paul sees it and it's a picture right. of his face and it says wanted burglar, you know, thief tonight. It's it's Julie's portrait. His earlier waitress, Terry Gar's character, had sketched this poster and had somehow like made Xerox copies of, of this poetry. <laughs> uh, you know, suspension and, of disbelief. At uh, this of point. course, of <laughs> course, yeah. And just sends him on the run again. So now there's a mob chasing him. I mean, it's gotten so ridiculous. Yes. And he's running, and there's this great moment where he kind of like stops on like these sort of stairs, and like he's got these like uh, fire escape stairs, and he looks in and sees through the window of another apartment. Oh, you know, this woman shoots right. her husband in the chest five times. And it's just so ridiculous. And I think it's part of the illicit gay stuff. You know, he's just taking in all of this insane underbelly stuff, but he just, he makes a great joke. He says, I'll probably get blamed for this too. And doesn't he, (laughs) doesn't he look to camera? Doesn't he like, look, doesn't he? he I don't know if it's direct, but yes, like he basically does. And he just sort of runs out and, and then he ends up in, and then he ends up finding another man. And this man, he ends up taking, he goes up to this guy's room. So this is now the the fourth person, the fifth person that he's, he's gone up to their room. And we have this interesting moment, I thought, and I actually want to hear your thoughts on this, where he kind of like Paul starts venting to this person about his night. And in doing so, in effect, sums up what's happened tonight. Like there is mm-hmm. some editing. We, we kind right. of jump ahead in the story so we don't hear everything we've seen. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was an interesting choice to watch for us, the viewers, to watch him sort of recount the night that we've seen. And just, I guess we hear mm-hmm. it in his words, but wh- why do you think that happened? Why do you think we have to hear it again? You know, sort of what happened, what we've already seen. I'm not sure. What, I mean, I took that as just kind of he's he's obviously just try, he has someone to talk to. He's in a safe place. And the fact that that guy is not really interested in that, that guy thinks they're going to sleep together. Right? And I think <laughs> that was that was our character venting and thinking. So I finally got someone who, who will listen to me and who will believe me or whatever. But that guy's just not really interested in what he's saying. He's got he's almost the roles are reversed in right. a way from, from that, why Paul came to downtown in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because like this is like our fourth, quote unquote, like romantic interest. Right. It's it's our, our first man. But like it's at this point that he feels comfortable confiding in him and telling him how he feels. Whereas with most of the other people, he's mostly been on the receiving end, like listening and and sort of just kind of taking in what other people have to say. And he's finally like, I want to, like, tell you my story, tell you how I feel. And maybe he only feels comfortable doing that in the presence of like another guy. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that sort of like, uh, he only feels comfortable around other men. Like, you know, there's one scene, I think he's in one of the bathrooms where there's like a, a guy with his penis hanging out and like a shark is trying to bite it. And so there's this whole notion of like, you know, castration and 
there's a bunch of other I, stuff. I, I in totally there. missed that. Wow. But, so, you know, maybe like around other dudes, he's like, I can kind of bro out with you and like tell you how I'm feeling and you won't judge me for that. Maybe because you're like, uh, you know, someone who will listen to me finally. Um, whereas everyone before, you know, he had other agendas with, Mm. we're in stretch territory sure. already so it's like it's you know what? And, I, and i like that i want to get into the sort of thematic the jewishness of it so mm -hmm. why don't i just take us through the end and let's then do it once yeah, we're there we can talk about the end a little bit and then really yeah. get to the fun part not that this hasn't been so much fun but <laughs> the mom eventually while he's in this house he sees the mom out the window they've discovered him so he decides his next his best course of action is to go back to the diner which hopefully will be open this time find tom and basically say to him you know i'm not the murderer you know sorry you know i'm not the thief you gave me your keys i didn't rob your place can you just tell everyone that I'm innocent? So he finds right. him there. He asks him for that. And then we see this great moment where, you know, Tom kind of goes outside, he sees Gail and the rest of the mob and he points right. sort of into the diner says he's there. And it's oh. clearly he hasn't found an ally in Tom. So while he's sitting at the diner, we mentioned this before, but he gets a sort of invitation to club Berlin. So he says, sure, I'm going to go back to club Berlin. And once he's there, it's funny because we had seen it, you know, in movie time, maybe 10 minutes earlier. And it was this, you know, this rage, you know, cagey fest kind of thing. And all of a sudden it's, it's completely over. empty. It's done. <laughs> and, then, and again, it's a great moment where he says, why is it empty? And they say, oh, well, it's invitation only. I guess, you know, you're the only one who got an invitation. <laughs> So while he's there, he, you know, he inquires about another woman he sees there, an older woman named June. And she apparently right. is just, you know, there all the time. And he goes over to her and eventually they go instead of, you know, up to her apartment, they go down to her apartment, which, you know, part of the, the spiritual, maybe, you know, hellish kind of descent. Mm. I just I wanted to throw that out there, Daniel. And, okay. and Neil, just, just, <laughs> I just, just, I just thought New York, New York basement apartment. Not right, weird. right, 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 right. <laughs> you know, which, which, which comes with its Which own could also be hellish but... anyway. So, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. that's true. Maybe not such For a sure. stretch. But yeah. anyways, he goes down there and there's this great moment where he is just like a baby in June's arms. Like you see, she kind of like, has, he lies down on June and she she basically caresses him. And for the first moment in the entire movie and the whole night, it's like, we can take a breath. Like she, he is just kind of cooling off, you know, being caressed by her. Oh, is that, that's when they're slow dancing, right? Like he puts in like a, a, a some money in the jukebox. I think he has a quarter left from, from all of his earnings from the night. And and they kind of like sort of slow down and they're finally slow dancing right. at this point he's just kind of like ah right. you know that that's when right. they're upstairs and ah. then and i had jumped then, ahead yeah. they go yeah. downstairs and that's when he's sitting on her couch and he's kind of being caressed by her downstairs and that lasts for another moment before all of a sudden the mob shows up and gail mm -hmm. is just leading the mob and somehow they've traced him down to club berlin and they're going down so june has this great solution like kiki earlier she's also a paper mache artist we get a little bit of echoing here right. and she says i have a great idea for how you can hide and she basically sculpts him into a paper mache and kind of freezes him into that spot. She leaves some gaps for the eye holes so he can see. Right. But eventually he and he becomes basically the same sculpture that we had seen earlier, the sort of Edward Monk looking, you know, sculpture that, mm -hmm. you know, Kiki had been creating earlier. And when he's there, it, it works effectively. Like the mob comes down, they can't find him, they leave. So mm -hmm. then he says, I'm stuck here. Can you please let me out, June? And she says, uh, not yet. I just I need to she, check to see if they're still she, here. Oh, she, right, puts, it, she puts it over. She's his his over his like, mouth. shut up. She silences another, him. She, she castrates it, you know, like another instance of a woman taking away his sort of oh, his voice. You know, I don't know. His voice. Yeah, sure. So he's stuck there. And all of a sudden, you know, it all seems doom and gloom. And then, you know, Cheech and Chong, the, the robbers, they've, they've come to a new place to rob. Somehow they found him at, at the sort of uh, at the Club Berlin. They come downstairs there. They rob the place. They recognize the statue. They think it's actually the same statue that they had stolen earlier from, you know, that they had stolen and lost earlier from Kiki. They take it. They throw it into the van. And then we get this sort of great close shot or not quite closing but ending shot where he's trapped in the back of the van we see him in this position he's you know we, we get a pov he's kind of staring out from the back of the van we watch as the sun kind of rises this whole night has you know, gone on and beautiful it's the morning and then in this great moment when they're turning the car toward of outside sort of outside of his of his workplace the the back flies open he right. goes flying out of it he, you know, he lands on the ground and it cracks kind of the paper mache. And in this distraught place, he just kind of stands up, walks through those golden gates towards his office. And we see him back in his office, work as usual, like, like nothing, like, I guess none or all of that has happened. And he is just transformed. And the movie ends with him, you know, back at his desk where we saw him in the beginning. Or does it? <laughs> so I just want a, a few things about the ending. I, they're very, very, um, I found interesting. So apparently Scorsese had shown the cut to the studio where it ended on that van shot and like him encased in the statue and that's where they ended it. And then the studio did not like that cut. So then he had to sort of like add that they did a reshoot where they filmed that last shot of the of the van kind of popping open and then he gets out. And so like he's okay in the end. But one thing we kind of alluded to earlier in the podcast was 
after he's sitting down at his desk, we sort of get this like flying around sort of the office shot. And, you know, he's back at his desk and we zoom around the office a few times and then we come back to his desk. He's not there anymore. And then we zoom around again. And there's this part where a woman is walking towards the camera. There's a cut to the beat. And then a man with a black trench coat walks out of the cubicle and away from the camera. And then the film ends. I'm happy to well, share missed, a screen with you, all of but that. It's, it's, it's super crazy. And uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I was but, go ahead. Danny, you, you know, you, you sent me that video where that comes from. We might have to link that in the show notes. Yeah, that was a, a sort of deep meditative study, yeah, you know, yeah. very, we could call that very Jewish in a certain sense, you know, that very, very Talmudic because like, it's like really, a very commentary Talmudic on a commentary down. on. Yeah. It's, it's definitely the subtext of the subtext, but you yes. know, Scorsese is one of the greatest filmmakers to ever live. He might right. have worked in, you know, sort of those loose shots and stuff. And wow. I think there could be something there. It's it's pretty wild. I'll I'll pull it up while you guys are while we're chatting because it's like it's one of those things where I was like, wait, what? And then he goes to the, this person. We'll link to his video, but there's something where he goes to the length of like putting together the soundtrack of the film versus what's in the film and showing that there's no cut in the music and there's like a metronome and he does this whole he goes to great lengths to show that uh this sort of like uh theory which i thought was very interesting but it's a way, what a way to end the film there's so much out there um about this film that i was not expecting wow um, <laughs> yeah and so like Wild. that's why um i'm down to explore all angles of this film because it's such a wacky film and it's like so unlike anything I would have expected from Scorsese because you know going to film school you think okay Scorsese is like Mean Streets, Casino, Raging Bull but like he also yeah, has yeah. this side of him which is kind of wild. Yeah this is funny for me because I mean I first saw this when I would have been whatever 13 years old and it came out to me this is just like a great cool New York movie that I felt special to get among my 13 year old friends because right. I understood it because I'd been in this neighborhood and I could relate and I knew these spots and everything so i felt really cool because of that and i'm sure i know i've seen it since then and obviously thought about it more but now watching clips and talking about it with you guys and notice i mean i'm sure in the i've probably never even seen the end credits i probably just left the theater or pressed stop or whatever but, you know i've never analyzed it like this but there's a lot going on yeah i mean unfortunately like i watched it on amazon prime video and i think they most much like most streaming services as soon as it goes to credits it oh, almost yeah. like kicks you out of the film unless you like deliberately right. click on so i like started watching the credits and then it just like minimized and went to the next thing and then only towards the end when i was like googling the film they're like oh did you see in the end credits and i was like oh i thought that was like only a marvel movie thing where you have to kind of stay through the end <laughs> right. credits but like here it's like not only the end credits where we don't see paul anymore but then really it's the last shot of the film where you see this man in a black trench coat walk away from screen maybe that's the grim reaper maybe that's death taking him on his final voyage Maybe that's just somebody delivering a bagel and cream cheese to someone at their desk. Maybe. I think the bagel and cream cheese statue does show up at the end, right? Like someone. Yeah, we see it. We see it somewhere in the movie. It, right. In one of the scenes. It, it shows someone, up. Oh, it's it's Terry Gar. She has it. Right, right. She Remember gives it to him. Yeah. And yeah. then I think at some point he's just like so fed up with it that he throws it somewhere. And so like this whole, you know, narrative device or this MacGuffin of like, having this uh he's like fuck it i'm done it's we're over with yeah all right he's done with it so that was our discussion of the plot of after hours we'll be right back with our discussion and rating of the film after hours Welcome back to Jews on Film we are here discussing after hours with Nabil Ayers where this segment of the podcast will rate the film on a scale of one to five Jewish stars, taking into account things like cast and crew, uh, Jewish content, like Jewish plot points, Jewish themes, you know, where to begin. I think there's so much stuff in here. We discussed a lot of uh, thematic elements. I would say for me, the cast and the crew, as far as I'm aware of, none were like explicitly Jewish or I did some, a little bit of research. Griffin Dunn is not Jewish. Yeah. None of the cast, I believe, was, uh, you know, noticeably Jewish. I have my suspicions that maybe, I don't know, Harry, what can you tell me about Teaneck? Is it was it a largely Jewish uh, town? You know, not necessarily large no. enough that there was people from all sorts. So right. you know, we we could probably do some research and figure that out, but right. I don't think we have enough to say offhand that there was a Jewish creative team behind this movie. Yeah, so not a lot on the cast and crew aspect. I think content wise, aside from the bagel, I don't know. There's not like 
and the fact that it took place in downtown New York and maybe there's some Jews there, but you know, I think for me, we can, uh, you know, we can kind of open the discussion quite a bit um, with themes, but I wanted to check in. Did anyone feel like cast and crew or content was very Jewish? Not I. The only thing I'll point out is that, yeah. you know, I was excited to do a Scorsese film for a while because while he's not a Jewish filmmaker, he's famously a Catholic filmmaker and famously right. not a Jewish filmmaker. But I do think that you get the advantage of working with someone who has intention in terms of the spirituality, the religiosity right. in terms of his films. Like, right. you know, we, I, I wish I had more examples to cite offhand, but I mean, he literally made The Last Temptation of Christ, you know, among a, a couple other movies that explicitly deal with faith. You know, there's a movie Silence he put out a couple of years ago that mm-hmm. I really did enjoy. And it's just, I think it gives us, and especially because he's such a talented filmmaker, you know, it really does give us license to maybe go with some of the stretches we've come up with. You know, there, there might be some that are far, far maybe a touch farther than he intended, but that's of course the name of the game. And that's what we love to do here at the pod. But, (laughs) but I do think that there is a clear, you know, spirituality in term or, you know, just a religious experience that's going on with this character that I I think most people not that maybe most people aren't reading that into it every time they watch it. But I think most people could agree is, is present in some of the strangeness of this movie. Definitely. Yeah. Nabil, did anything stick out to you? No. I mean, other than the, other than the bagel in the early <laughs> scene, I mean, to me, it's a much more of a New York movie, which, which of course is synonymous with, with being Jewish in my childhood. But, but I mean, really, if you try to break it down, it doesn't feel like a Jewish movie at all to me. Okay. Interesting. So, so then let's open up the box. I feel like uh, let's open up that Jewish thematic box and kind of get our, our stretch glasses on and, and uh, you know, we're all wearing glasses, but uh, you know, I feel like we can all, Admit that there's something to this film that felt Jewish enough that we wanted to talk about it. You know, I think one thing, you know, there's this notion in, you know, about Teshuva, which is like returning. And so for me, like the, the one of the Jewish themes is like literally he's quite literally returning. Right. So he's like starting at work. He's ending at work. Doing Teshuva is like people like say repentance and stuff, but it's also like returning, evolving, changing. And I think that is something that he does throughout the course of the film. You know, he starts out you know, pretty beige, bland, boring, sort of standard issue, yuppie scum, kind of douchey dude who tries to take advantage of of women. And then by the end of the film, he's like a little bit more open and honest. Arguably, he's being mistaken for like a robber. So maybe he hasn't quite evolved. But I thought there's some sort of character change that goes on throughout the film. So that was one that stuck out to me. Yeah. I I mentioned this earlier, but I did want to highlight it one more time, just this idea of temptation and the idea of kind of like seeing and looking at what you're not supposed to. Like there is, I I like this whole movie, I think to a certain extent uh, more obviously is about his kind of descent into this sort of Soho underbelly and whether that's, you know, a fair appraisal of Soho in the eighties, because like you said, it wasn't, you know, Nubiel, you said this earlier, like it wasn't necessarily crime ridden or dangerous. It just was, you know, maybe a little off centered for, you know, the lifestyle of what we're seeing as a sort of a Jewish guy living in the, in the eighties and the nineties, you know, sort of working, you know, a, a, a classic nine to five day job doing, I forgot what I called it, sort of big computer processing, word process analytics, analytics. Yeah. Yeah. Word yeah. processing right. analytics. Exactly. So it's definitely alternative and it's definitely his descent. I mean, it's literally, you know, you're going deeper, you're going South sort of in the city, you're going, you know, deeper into, you know, what I'm calling the underbelly. And it's a little more spiritual, you know, I'm not pointing to something specifically Jewish, although I will in a moment. But, you know, just in general, I think that there is like, you know, this exposure to and this curiosity in things that are a little alternative, things that could be a little bit illicit. I mean, there certainly is some sort of, you know, there's a little bit more of like sex and perversion that's going on, Mm -hmm. I think, in some of the scenes in the late night diners. And I think that's supposed to represent this kind of temptation by evil. I will uh, just to conclude what I was saying about because I do think that the gaze is a big part of it. And then I think that there's a huge, you know, the the way that he sort of gazes at these, you know, from from the story that he tells about the the, you know, the burn injury and taking right. off his eyelids to throughout mm-hmm. the film where he's kind of, you know, peering in. And even when, like we said earlier, when he looks into the window and he sees someone get shot, I mean, he can't stop himself right, from just right. like taking all this in and where the movie puts him at the very end is they put him in this full body cast. And like we mentioned, they cover up his mouth, they cover up his whole body, but they leave two sockets for the eyes. Oh, and good, all good he has one. left is his capacity to see. But unlike that first scene in the movie we were talking about where he's looking all over the place and he's kind of in the office looking everywhere, he's completely frozen. So all he 
can see is one direct view out mm-hmm. the back of the van. Interesting. And the movie kind of like apparently it punishes him, it paralyzes him, it forces him to just, you know, be stuck immobile and looking straight. And I, I did think that there was something, you know, sort of spiritual and punishment and kind of, you know, getting what he what he deserved at the after a night of just, you know, looking where he wasn't supposed to, taking the blindfold off in the burn unit and and just to pull in the Jewish illusion, which you know, could be where Scorsese was going. This might not, but this is Jews on film. So I want to make sure that I get this in here, but we sure. spoke about this offline, Daniel, but yeah. I felt like there was a big sort of the story of Sodom, you know, and, and the character of Lot and Lot's wife, where the, the way the story goes is, you know, God tells, you know, this character of Lot that the, the, that he's in the, he's living in this town of Sodom and it's going to be burnt down and the whole city is going to go on fire and you need to take your entire family and you need to leave and you need to run out in the middle of the night and whatever you do, you cannot look back. You know, he's given the same advice that this kid is get, that, that, you know, Paul as a kid is given in the hospital. He goes, you cannot take the blindfold. You cannot look back. Right. And obviously, and the way the story ultimately goes is his wife decides, you know, she's going to look back and peer. She becomes sort of morbidly curious and she is, you know, her punishment is she is sort of, you know, frozen in place, turned into salt, kind of, you know, made to stay there immobile you know, forever. And, and I just, I'm I not sure that. if that's where the, that. the end of the movie was. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure if that's where he is at the end. If he's, you know, he's covered in the white plaster. So he kind of looks salty. And I don't know. I don't know if that's where Scorsese is going, but I do think that it does show the sort of Jewish, you know, biblical, you know, biblical Christian Jewish, you know, because obviously as a Catholic, he, he might've been familiar with this, but it shows that sort of biblical theme of, you know, sometimes things are so immoral, so illicit, you're not supposed to look there. And as an upstanding person, you know, you're not, you're not allowed to look. And if you do, you know, you'll face the consequences. So that was kind right. of that was kind of the path that I was pulling through this movie beyond, like you were saying, Nabil, the, the surface level. He's just a guy in New York having a bad night in Soho, which is <laughs> right. or, or a great night, probably, right. or, or a great right. night. I love right, that. Right. Right. Or a great night, like which is that, those are all the movies. Those about. are really good points you make. About, I mean, it's not necessarily a Jewish thing, but certainly a religious thing. And I'm not a very religious person, but I have lots of friends and relatives who have been. And there's always this sort of inherent like careful what you wish for don't do the wrong thing you'll be punished all those kind of themes that are prevalent in in lots of religions and i think this is like an hour and a half version of that where this is just a normal guy uptown looking to have some fun went downtown and just got sort of trapped in this endless layer of sort of short lessons that maybe was supposed to become one long lesson but every little thing he tried to do had a result that was much worse and mm-hmm. that, that kept kind of descending into this thing where every time he tried, even when he was trying to do the right thing, sort of, but not always, he was punished for it. Right. And the whole thing was kind of one bit. It was basically like, you shouldn't have gone downtown. That, right. That's right. Kind you of never should have left like a sanctuary right. of your home at 11. Your, your life was fine. You didn't need to be curious. You didn't need to look outside. Everything was fine before you tried that. Right. I think he went a step too far with a lot of the stuff. Like he was just supposed to get the keys, but he got the keys and then went to the bathroom right. and flushed the toilet. And then, you know, Always. he went back in and he like stole the $20 bill, which was not his. So by stealing it, he went to the cab and then he was punished for that. There's a lot of other right, stuff. Right. I think one thing, Carrie, that you were talking about with, with Lot's wife, another sort of, you know, um, thing with, with, um, Judaism is like the priestly blessing sometimes in synagogue where you're supposed to like look away from it. It's there's no like direct punishment for like looking while the priests are doing their blessing and things like that. Like I've not uh, seen anyone turn into salt or anything like that. But, you know, there's just another example of kind of like looking away and, you know, you're quite literally covering yourself in the prayer shawl, the talit um, while that happens. So that made me, you know, it's just another example of something like that. Um, I did think the the sort of the depiction of like um sex in the film and like different different types of 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 love i would should say you know whether it's like uh you know homosexual sex or bdsm or it all is sort of depicted in like in a way that's sort of unfamiliar to paul paul is like very used to like sort of the what you know meat and potatoes sort of standard for him version and when he sees it all he's like a bit uh you know, he has maybe this sort of like Catholic view or whatever. Yeah, I don't know what's way term. out of his comfort zone. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. He's like total fish out of water. And so the maybe that there's, well, not necessarily like a Jewish theme, but sort of the, I don't know, attitude towards uh, sex and, and, and uh, non-conventional ways for him of love are, are, you know, maybe something we can glean from there. But yeah, go ahead. There, there's an interesting thing that I noticed on this watch that I didn't pick up on before with kind of the male characters versus the female characters where other than Linda Fiorentino, who is very hard edged, very kind of stereotypically New York, 
all the men, the bar owner, the cab driver, the subway operator guy, the guy at the booth in the subway, uh, the bouncer are so sort of almost like stereotypical New York characters in the movie. Mm-hmm. A lot of this yeah. like, hey, yeah. what do you, you know, like right. really like New York, Love New York. It. Yeah. But the women, I'm going to name the actresses, but Rosanna Arquette, Terry Garr, Catherine O'Hara, these women are all these sort of very almost like Midwestern, pure blonde. Like they're not at oh, all stereotypical New York people. Right. They're all yeah. these much to me. I took it as kind of safer, more trustworthy characters. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is that that is a lot about the New York that I remember of that time is I think pe- people tend to think like, oh, everyone in New York is crazy and has that accent and isn't as mean and short and everything. But so many people move to New York. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was actually it's interesting, the balance of men and the women, because that feel, felt off to me. And maybe that was deliberate. But mm-hmm. but all of those Terry Gard, all those characters actually felt incredibly authentic to me because those are the types of people that move to New York, which are just everyone from everywhere who is looking to that's make cool. paper mache or do whatever they're doing. So, you know, that was sort of our discussion of, sort of the themes of the film and its Jewishness or religiousness and things like that. But I want to talk, you know, numbers. Let's uh, let's go around. Um, Nabil, you're our guest. If you'd like, you could start. So ranked on Jewishness, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm stretching it to give it a two. And I okay. absolutely love this movie and loved it even more after watching it again. And two feels high to me because it's really not very Jewish, but... I was so pleasantly surprised by the bagel thing in the beginning being kind of a, a weird, important totally. aside that struck sure. me. And then again, just back to kind of me associating that time and place where the movie was shot, what the neighborhood looked like with my Jewish relatives and Jewish family. So I, I gave it a little bit extra because of that. So two stars. Okay. And Harry, what about yourself? Yeah, I, I kind of think I feel similarly. I mean, I, I can't claim to have grown up in New York in the in the eighties. I uh I was, you know, at that point negative whatever the number is. So uh so it wasn't necessarily recognizable to me, but I loved getting your perspective on that, Nabil, and a little bit of your rants, Daniel. And and I've dealt with subways. I mean, the subways are, you know, whatever. They're not a dollar fifty anymore. And thankfully I I can also pay for them on my phone, which I usually have on me. So that's not, you know, I haven't run into those same issues, but there's definitely a New Yorkiness to this movie that probably comes first and foremost. And, you know, if we want to tie sort of you know, New York in the 80s to a certain Jewishness, like, sure, but that's not really enough for me to give it an extra point. I do think that this was a very spiritual movie. Like I've been saying the Scorsese thing a lot, that he's a very spiritual filmmaker and you can watch some of his movies and say, you know, not quite sure I saw that there, but I think more so than some of his others, I really did feel like we weren't meant to only take things as their surface level, like it just got so weird. And so, you know, the the sort of the cause and effect of everything that happened just felt so deliberate to me in a way and random, but deliberately random to me in a way that I felt like there was some intention there. So I think that will also get me to, to my two stars. Cause other than that, you know, he's not a Jewish filmmaker. There's no explicit Jewish content. You know, I'm almost one and a half, but I'll give, I'll give it the two stars because, uh, because I think you made some good points there. So yeah, two, two out of five stars, Jewish film. How about you, Daniel? What do you think? Well, here I go, Harry, on one of my subway rants. Come on, <laughs> rants. That's no fair. Um, That's what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fair. It's fair. Um, I'm gonna go. I'll give it. I'll give it one star for the bagel. Right. So right off the bat, we're already at one. I think you know. Let's go like a quarter star for like. The, you know, the load story, I think, I think all that stuff's great. Again, this is all subtextual. Um, like you said, Harry and Nabil, like the film was great. I sort of loved the the never ending just kind of like you know just a terrible night or a great night but just sort of this sort of uh book of job quality where like seemingly Mm. all this just bad stuff kept happening to him and he you know towards the end of the film i think he loses faith that it's ever going to resolve itself but you know he was pretty hopeful that he would get his dollar bill and get his cab ride back and there were points in the film that felt you know hopeful but you know, yeah. his plans were dashed. I would probably go like, you know, maybe split the difference. So Nabil, you were at like one and a half and Harry, you were I at did two. two. I went a full two. You went two and Harry, where'd you go? Yeah. I matched the two. Okay. Two. So I don't want to be this uh, different person. I, I you know, I want to, f- but then there's also this sense of like belonging and exclusion. Like that's a pretty, you know, it's a common theme for a lot of cultures, but I also feel like, you know, you know, him wanting to belong and then sort of belonging, but still being othered because he's got his suit and tie on and he doesn't have the mohawk. Maybe that's like the keeper, so to speak, or I don't know. This is way too stretched territory. So I'm going to probably go um, 
you know, I'll meet you both where you're at and fit in. So I'll go two stars as well. Um, so that was our review of the film After Hours. Nabil Ayers, thank you so much for being here on Jews on Film to discuss th- uh, this film. Thank you for picking it. Um, thank you. This is really, really fun. And I need to go watch it again now that we've talked about it so much <laughs> and see all these things that, <laughs> that I didn't notice before. Well, before you do, I want to make sure that you have a chance to talk about your book, which I uh, I picked up here at the Seattle Public Library. And I would encourage oh, everyone to, to go order the book on, you know, third place books or Amazon books or wherever you can. Um, but tell us a little bit about your book, My Life in the Sunshine. I mean, the, the quick elevator pitch, which I'm still not good at, is uh, it's a memoir. It's about my entire life. My father is the jazz musician Roy Ayers. I've never really known him, but always known his music, always kind of existed in his shadow in a way and that his music appears all the time. I work in the music business, played in bands for years, now run a record company. Um, And it's really just about about my kind of quest to as an adult when I was in my 30s to try to finally connect with him and kind of had this great meeting once, but then it sort of went away and I wasn't able to get in touch with him and really wanted to learn more about my family and about family history and all these kinds of things. And so... I was able to kind of go around him and through 23andMe met so many other people. And now I'm just connected with all these people, some of whom I'm related to, some of whom I'm not, but they're all family. And there's lots of music and lots of fun throughout. Yeah. I mean, I loved, uh, you know, living in Seattle like I do now. I loved like you know, hearing about all the Seattle parts from before I lived here and then also just hearing about, I mean, it was all great. So I recommend everyone go check out that book. Um, Harry, I know it's a new season, so I wanted to check with you. Is there anything you want to plug? No, just keep listening to the podcast. Season three is going to be a really good one. Got some great guests, including Nabil. Well, he's no longer lined up. We, we've we had a great guest already in Nabil. We have some more great ones lined up. So please, if you're listening to this one, keep tuning in. Listen to the last two seasons. They were also pretty great. And I'm just happy to keep doing this. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think, you know, for everyone who is not a, a follower online, you know, we're on all the platforms now. We're on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, on Twitter. Uh, you know, maybe there'll be a new social platform, you know, by the time this is released. But uh, make sure to follow us, comment, let us know if there's a film you'd like us to to, to check out. And uh, Nabil, thanks for being here. Harry, thanks as always for being here. Thank you. A great time. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good one. Bye-bye. Jews on Film is hosted and produced by Harry Ottensasser and Daniel Zana. Daniel and Harry edited this episode. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Jews on Film and subscribe to our podcast to get new episodes. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.